We're going to start this <coughs> process, uh, this long conversation, if there is to be a city plan, informally and today. Uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your uh, hands. Uh, there are going to be uh, bunches of people, so I'm going to uh, call you by number because of the way I saw this track. Um, and before we do uh, start, I want to, uh, I see uh, 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 Councilor Adrian Carr in the uh, audience. Thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on your reelection. And I want to acknowledge uh, your presence today. Thank you. Uh, start with hands, please. Two. I'll, I'll just give a number so that I'll, I'll remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three, four. Okay. Yeah, but just the latest presentation mentioned uh, mentioned uh, resilient processes um, in reference to planning. So I'm interested in uh, just maybe hear you talk a little bit more about what resilience means in terms of the process, and perhaps a little bit more about what resilience might mean in terms of um, a resilient city plan. What would that imply for a city plan? Um, perhaps in the context of um, like a, a post-disaster kind of scenario. Um, so it's probably about three questions in there, but basically revolving around the term resilience. I, I seem to see it cropping up more and more in the uh, academic discourse. Sure. Um, if I use the word resilience, it was a mistake, actually. I, I find it to be a painful term in many ways. But um, that aside, I think the key issue for plans is, is that balance between certainty and flexibility. And especially with a community-wide plan that done at most for 10 years, and more often over 15 to 20, and with city planning it'll be at least 20. So over that time scale, you can't possibly anticipate everything that's going to happen. I, I think uh, an interesting thing that plans can sometimes do is actually build um, explicitly adaptable policy into them. So they can say, look, if, this, if these conditions are in place, our policy will be this. If these conditions are in place, our policy will be this. So that you can explore during the planning process different scenarios for what might come at you and build policies that can fit within either of those. The other thing you can obviously do is, is things like a climate adaptation plan where you actually look quite carefully at what's likely to come at you and identify specific ways that you can adapt and, and mitigate the risks that, that you can identify through those. So both of those, I think, address that question. Who's number two, please? Yes. What happens, in, as in the case of the City of North Vancouver, when you've done all the engagement, the staff has done all the work, and you ultimately don't get the backing of your city council? Do you go back to the drawing board? Um, I just is directed to you, Patrick. Right, will you be yeah, I mean, involved in that? A couple things to say. One, yeah, you absolutely have to have councils backing, both to initiate the process, which in the City of North Vancouver they did, uh, you know, uh, an enduring staff. Richard White was there and had been for 15 to 20 years and had the political uh, capacity to uh, understand what the value of this was and how it supported uh, the, the discussions at the council level. So it worked in their interest to give credence and to visualize what they've been trying to articulate in the absence of pictures. Uh, and if you look at the track record of the existing council in the city of North Vancouver, they've done pretty well. Uh, their recent election was not without debates about high rises and density and so forth, but they survived and that 100-year plan has become the basis for two different official community plan updates now. And, you know, pertinent to what uh, Peter was just saying, uh, th that was a 50-year plan and nobody expects it to be followed 50 years from now. But what, what I argue is it tells you what to do Monday. You know, it gives a 50-year plan is really good at telling you what you ought to do Monday. Now, should I widen that sidewalk? Or, you know, what about this project? How does this relate to a long-term vision? Of course, it's going to change significantly, and you could do a 50-year plan every 10 years if you wanted to. 
But I think, particularly in our time, we we're all trying to create a sustainable city for our kids, and that takes 50 years to execute because cities change so slowly. That's the real value of it. In response to your question about the role of the politician, when I go elsewhere in the world, because a lot of people are interested in how did Vancouver turn from what it was in the 50s and 60s, which I would say was an unspectacular city in a spectacular setting, and then 30, 40 years later, we're suddenly one of the most livable cities in the world. And I always start off by saying the whole process started and was carried because city councils over the years had, had visions and wanted to see those visions happen and engage the community in many of those visions. And so I always start, if you don't have the political support to start, why even start your planning process? I started, I was part of a planning process called the Vancouver Plan in about the late 1980s. And it was one staff really felt we needed a citywide plan. And the council kind of said, yawn, go ahead. And we did it. It was received by council. Council said, yawn. And it went on the, you know, on the shelf. It wasn't until later that council got so frustrated by what was happening in every time staff and council proposed a new development that it was getting opposition that then council said, and I still remember Gordon Campbell taking his shoe off, banging it on the desk and saying, <laughs> let the public walk in our shoes. And so to me, it's the uh, public engagement and to the question about uh, resiliency we can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, but if you have a very knowledgeable, engaged public, when some major issue happens, you've got the ideas of the whole community to call on. That was number three? Yeah. Is that correct? That uh, four, was, and then... Was number three. three. Sorry, number two, number three then. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in that public engagement process and how uh, a large citywide plan would, um, how different neighborhoods would interact with each other. Um, one of the things we've seen with the Grandview Woodland local area plan right now is that um, some of the, the objections that came up from residents was, okay, if I'm being asked to take on more density, am I being asked to take on more than my share versus other neighborhoods? And uh, another issue that has come up is the issue of um, we don't have as many parks as other neighborhoods. This is, again, an inter-neighborhood equity issue. Um, so I, I can see how a, a large citywide plan would help with that, because then you could help to, to map out you know, who's getting what density and, and that issue of fairness. But on the other hand, I look at the, the plan that just went through in the downtown east side and how that puts, put the brakes on development to a certain extent and put a lot of emphasis on not having displacement. And I wonder if the, if the entire city was doing a plan at the same time, if the emphasis on the needs of people in local communities, especially that didn't have political capital, would be less. And if, if a group like the Downtown East Side or other groups that didn't have as much political influence would get railroaded by the aspirations of other parts of the city that displace misery or, or, or undesirable things towards those areas that, that um, can't resist them. So, so I, I'm just interested in that inter-neighborhood dynamics and even how you would go about the public participation to create a healthy process. Uh, maybe one day you can, you can give a talk on city plan. But the notion there was to engage people from all communities thinking about the city first. And just to very quickly comment on how you engage people who aren't normally part of a political process. Mm -hmm. One is translation. City Plan ran in six written languages and eight spoken languages. It brought a whole new um, community to the table. Secondly, in areas like the downtown east side, are people necessarily able to write sort of academic pieces or pieces about their neighborhood? No. But we certainly had staff sitting down with people and talking to them and then writing up the material on their behalf. I think that you need the broad city-wide discussion to set a context, and this is one of the things I wonder about some of the plans now that seem to be just happening, but are they going to be taking their share? And just as an example of how you look at the take share idea, during the city plan visions process, a neighborhood would be doing a plan using the broad context that had been approved through city plan, 
and the neighborhood would be very engaged. But we also had a group called the City Perspectives Panel. Anybody ever heard of the City Perspectives Panel? They were a group of people from other neighborhoods around where that plan was being done. And they were invited by council to watch what was happening in that neighborhood. And if that neighborhood was busy saying, well, everybody else can take more density, but not us. Everyone else can take recycling center, but not us. Those citizens from other neighborhoods were there to say, excuse me, if you don't take a share, what happens in our neighborhood? So I think neighbor to neighbor can also be part of a process to make sure that the issues and interests of all are involved, not just each neighborhood mm -hmm. on its own time. And I'll add one thing to that. Having done this not in Vancouver with the authorization of the Vancouver city, but in many of the surrounding cities over 20 times, we have never found a case where if you frame the question correctly, people will operate from their, self, their selfish interests. It's, it's a matter of setting the goal. What kind of city do you want? Where do you want your kids to live? Do you want them safe? Do you want it to be affordable? Do you want you know ways to get around other than the car? Uh, do you want uh, natural resources protected? The answer to that is always yes, yes, yes. Because you know people really are the same on that one. It's when we get mired down in the mark of, well, I don't want that next door to me, or as you say, this neighborhood's not taking its share, that it goes off the rails. So my experience, which I'd share with the people in this room, is I think City Plan did this, except they didn't come up with a plan at the end of it for the, for the whole city as a map. Uh, my advice is start with the discussion of what do you want your city to be like? What is your main goal? What are your objectives on the way to that goal? Formalize that agreement. And then execute a planning process that would come up very quickly with a plan. I mean, the word charrette is bandied around uh, often incorrectly. But I don't think it's inconceivable to, at a certain point in this process, have a citywide charrette with 20 different tables around the city, organized around their own, their own geographic area, but connected and exhibited as a plan for the whole city at one time. I think it's actually totally doable. The only caution I would have, and a number of years ago, the Vancouver City Planning Commission, who are hosting today, did something called the Goals for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And that was a creative look at everything people would like about their city. The difficulty in trying to implement it was that it never engaged people in the tough choices. Mm -hmm. And so we had developers standing there with the Goals for Vancouver, waving them and saying, it says we want to add housing in the neighborhood. And the same material on the same page, the community was saying, it says in this one, don't change the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you do at some stage really have to get to some of those tough choices, whether it's limited land or limited money, and how that those choices are going to be made becomes a basis often for then having to make some tough choices. And I, I just want to interject because I'm getting excited. I argue, that, <laughs> I argue that it's the drawing, the actual drawing that resolves those contradictions. Because when you actually put new buildings on the ground, actually take away somebody's house, actually change things, actually have a new street where there wasn't one before, you know, those are where those contradictions become obvious. You can't avoid them when you're doing the drawing. That's why the drawing is so crucial. Accepting, remember, public <laughs> city of North Vancouver. I said 20 tables, not one. Well, <laughs> 20 tables might be 20 of this group in the room. There's over a million people use the city think, of Vancouver every I day. Think, so. I think you can do it. I yeah. maintain you yeah. can do it. <laughs> We've got 20 minutes left, number four, number five, and then everybody <laughs> raise their hands. Okay. Six. Uh, sorry. Six down here. Six. Seven. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, my name is William Gibbons. What really brought me here today was the announcement that you were going to talk about the plan from, I think, 1929 for Vancouver. <laughs> And I thought it was kind of ironic um, because uh, two of your presenters had mentioned uh, the Surrey plan, current Central City plan. So I have a two-part question. First of all, Michael Alexander is director of the City Compensations Program. I want to ask you if you'd invite me to give a presentation on the same basis as these bigwigs from the city. We can talk about that on, later. 
on Thank you. my research funded by Metro, TransLink, City of Surrey, and SFU. We can talk about that later, the please. Historic Stick city to this one, or please. Map. I'd like to claim extra time because I've been refused the right to present to the Mayor of Mount Table, also by UBC. We don't and have extra time, sir. So I'm placing a challenge on you to put your money where your mouth is, just like I'm prepared to do. Ah. For our speaker, we get back to this, this yeah, particular. Back yeah. to this particular <laughs> Let me just interrupt, please. No, no. So please. back to our speaker and your uh, mention of the city of Surrey's current plan for Central Surrey, the 1910-12 plan for Port Metro is actually out of the picture, and it's very significant because the plan for Port Man is intimately tied to the history of Vancouver particularly because it was one of DC's first major alleged real estate fraud cases, and that is tied to the switching of the railway terminals from Port Man to Vancouver. Not on license play, but a Broadway subway, which Mr. Robertson is trying to pull off. And so we're faced with many regional issues. So my question for our speakers today is, remember in news reports recently, have talked about conflicts with people wanting a mega city or not. Regional city centers managed by the people that live there are a mega metro region. And speaking as someone that ran in the 2011 provincial by election in Vancouver Point Grey and ran in the provincial election. Let's get to the. Can we get to the. Number five, please. To say on whether we need a mega city in this region or whether we need regional city cities that are more sensitive to the people that live there. Next question. Next, Next question. question. Oh, no answer. Uh, no to a mega city. I've worked in enough mega cities. Uh, I think that while we have warts in our system here, there's a lot bigger warts when you talk to people from Toronto about the challenges they've had trying to bring everything together. And so I think that what we have here Consensus is often difficult, but yet I think we recognized internationally for having done some great things through consensual processes as opposed to through forced amalgamation processes. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. How about you, Mr. I'd like to delve please. into the process part of how we get to the citywide plan. Peter talked about a vision being essential and acknowledging that we might not resolve all of the conflicts that exist in that vision and Anne talked about building on the vision statements that are out there and I'd like to know how we would move from interpretation by some neighborhoods of those vision statements being regulatory documents that govern their principality if you want to call it that and, and translating that into what Patrick talks about as a more aspirational place for the city-wide um, future that we look at, how do we get back down to putting on paper then what is distilled from the, that direction of those visions? Well, you know, I'll, I can give a quick response to that, hopefully a provocative one. I think city plan is a good, you know, basis. Take it the next step. The next step is to do a drawing of the city as we expect it to be 50 years from now. Use that as a basis for a new zoning map and a new set of policies. Get away from funding the city's capital improvement budget with CACs. Use DCL because you accurately identify how many libraries the city needs, how many swimming pools, where they might best be. Uh, that would be my that would be my uh, recommendation. So you'd say scrap the vision statements that exist today. I might not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I think there's a tremendous amount of power and effort and many many voices that are in the community visions documents, um, as well as in, in city plan, which to me reads much more like a, a vision statement, if you like, set of goals and objectives for the city. And when I think about a vision for a, for a city, I think about something that's fairly short, frankly. You can, maybe you can't leave it in your head, but a couple of pages at most is, is, is what you can deal with. But how do you translate that down into uh, something that's real on the ground is, is the crux of the matter. I think Patrick's approach is, is an interesting one, and it's a helpful one. Um, in Prince George, we use an approach that's not dissimilar, but instead of just taking growth and uh, the shape and pattern of development, we also ask the question, we essentially set up a set of tw about 20 goal statements, 
um, made some either qualitative or even quantitative assessments of how different city patterns would uh, affect each of those goals. And we brought them back to the public and said, look, there is development pattern. If you continue as a status quo with your existing regulations, here's what it looks like, here's how it performs. We did about three other patterns. It resulted in a shift from 80% greenfield development to 80% infield development at a policy level. It's tremendous, huge change. That, that was the first part of the conversation I talked about earlier. The second part of the conversation is, okay, well, we put a big dot around this neighborhood center and a lightly shaded area around that. Well, now what does that look like? Is that two stories? Is it four stories? Is it a strip mall right now? Well, how are we actually going to get the strip mall to shift to another type of development? If it's successful, it's going to be six or eight stories, maybe, depending on land values. So how do you then have that conversation and bring in some of those real considerations to the community and say, look, uh, it would be really nice to replace a strip mall with a two-story apartment building and a couple of retail stores, but it's not going to work. So what will work? Well, here's three or four forms that will work. Let's have that conversation with the real information in front of us and give people an understanding of those trade-offs and help the community walk through those difficult choices, illustrated in ways that they understand. I'd certainly love focus on the piece of the community visions which physically identified where a neighborhood center was going to be. And then, much like in Knight and Kingsway, go in and work with the community using, as I mentioned, a set of existing, a menu of existing <coughs> schedules. It took quite a while, it took about 14 months to do Knight and Kingsway, and a lot of that was inventing new zoning schedules which would fit into the community. Most of those schedules are there now. We can see what they look like when they're built because building's happening. I would take that menu of schedules, I would locate it where basically the community said they wanted to see the centers, and then work on exactly what the zoning's going to be and get the zoning in place. I think we actually, in retrospect, spent too long on the broad community vision and too little time getting it drilled down to the next level, which is the zoning level. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's, yeah. I think we agree on that. But I would, I would just say that don't start from scratch. I would be going out and saying to the community, you know, you have had these discussions in the past, you've had these areas that you're thinking might be your community center. We'd like to see it happen. Let me give you a good example if you pretend the past never happened. We saw what happened on Point Grey Road. If you know something, if you look back an urban landscape task force in the early 1990s did a greenways map for the city. And part of that greenway was going along Point Grey Road. I, if I was council, might have said, you know, the community was really supportive of the greenways map, a greenways plan. We now have the funding to proceed with the piece that was going to go along the waterfront there. We're going to move on that. As opposed to pretending it came from nowhere and it was the personal invention. And so I think that in many cases, if you can engage people from the past and bring them into the future, better than pretending nothing has happened. Dunbar was a little tougher to do. Dunbar is the toughest. Okay. <laughs> Number six. Um, when talking about citywide plans, I've seen a lot of different kinds of citywide plans. And I've seen the kind that Patrick's been talking about, which seems to have a drawing of the whole thing. And I've seen the kind that Anne has uh, has created the city plan in Vancouver, which is more a set of principles and concepts. Um, and in both of those, what troubles me is that they seem to be obsolete almost as soon as they're published. And the question that I've been struggling with in other contexts is how, how do we deal with that? And recently I've come upon a, a thought with some other people thinking, not mine that seems to maybe be a way to do this, and I would like to ask the panelists to comment on it. And that is, rather than publish a plan, a citywide plan, which I think should be more like Anne suggested and less like Patrick suggested, it should be more conceptual. Maybe it's a place, maybe it's a process, maybe it is something where citizens are constantly engaging in that vision of their city that is, that is 
really documented in a three-dimensional place. It might have a model, it might have, uh, it might have music, it might have many other kinds of ways to document that, and, and, and once a year is confirmed to be the vision of the place, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, and then leave the drawings to the specifics of neighborhoods and communities and, and, and that. And I just wondered uh, what the three panelists might think about this. You see, I think that with the social networks that we have now and the speed of communication we have now and the speed with which we change our opinions that we have now, that to publish a plan and say it's from now to 2050 is, is becoming less and less relevant every day. Mm -hmm. I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I think that the drawing is fundamental as the access way for citizens to understand what they're buying into and to be able to engage in a policy discussion without glossing over the contradictions between you know, housing affordability, transportation, desirability of new green systems, because the drawing has to resolve those contradictions. You could do Wait that in a place, though. Excuse me, just a minute. Having said that, however, I don't think that the drawing is a, is a fixed document. It can be an organic document that grows into the future. I think it would behoove us, though, to use a drawing or a series of drawings to at least, if nothing else, update the zoning map and to have a citywide document that that relates to, uh, valid if not forever for five or ten years. And then my final comment, without wanting to take the floor for too long, I really think starting with an objective of 50 years in the future is a necessary precondition for understanding where you want to go. Cities take that long to get built. And again, I'll repeat it, it tells you what to do Monday. It also gives the citizens something much more uh, robust than a policy paragraph about what's going to happen in their neighborhood or what they have collectively decided. They can say, well, what you're proposing with that 40-story tower next to this Broadway subway station uh, does not look at all like I thought we were going to get. So can I jump in on that one quickly? Um, I, I've been a big fan of the idea of small plans with enabling systems for implementation and really invest in resources in implementation. I'm intrigued by the idea of having a plan sort of in a place, and it could be in a digital place as well. Um, and I'd argue that it, you could draw policies from the various panoply of plans that Anne showed and pull them together to get to a place that captures them and makes them easily accessible to people. I happen to like the visual representations. Um, but if you think of a, of a plan, we talked about planning as making decisions for the future. And we're doing that daily. So a plan, to think about a plan as, as a thing that lands in 2015 and then doesn't get changed in 2025 is crazy. Uh, we actually need to think of plans and planning as being talk of living documents, where we literally need to think of them that way and maybe actually create them and maintain them that way. And maybe that's a bit more what you're talking about. There's a lot of space for diagrams, images, to say that's what this plan looks like here or here. Um, but I love that idea. Um, so for me, it's about a small plan as a document that captures that guiding direction, the policies, the vision, and that's then built on over time and adjusted over time with diagrams, new policies, new directions, experiments, whatever it might be. Yeah. Thank you. Time's getting short. Number six, number seven. Yeah. Uh, number eight. Seven, sorry. Oh, sorry. Number sorry. seven, number eight. <clears throat> I joined the city in '93, and I think the city plan is uh, maybe a year or so underway by then. Uh, and when the then, then director of planning, Tom Fletcher, took me over to the city plan group's office in City Square, I was looking at what they were doing and asked a basic question, uh, which is what Peter said at the beginning was a plan for. And, he's, and I asked is, well, this is for comedy growth. And the then senior planner involved with that said, no, it's not about growth. I, I, I couldn't conceptualize uh, planning for the future, didn't accommodate that. And his answer was, it's about change, whatever that is, the maturing neighborhoods, the turnover, the change of one group's generations for another, I guess, but not necessarily to accommodate more people which is a sort of a shocking thing in today's life where we know we have to accommodate more people. So uh, one of the values I see for a citywide plan is that it's a structuring document. 
Uh, and I use uh, the District of North Van, which has a very simple diagram of the nodes and corridors. You know where the town centers and village centers are. It didn't obviate or eliminate the need for two more years in each one of those centers to go through landing it on the ground. And Patrick was involved in one in Portland and Valley. But all that work was probably circa 2007. We're just now implementing with our first developments seven years later. So uh, you still need to drill down, but that diagram is understood by everybody in the community. They know what centers are, they know the boundaries of those centers. They know, generally speaking, what can go on there, and there's even a number attached to how many people or how many units could be accommodated there. So I think some kind of conceptual notion with numbers as well as imagery and a diagrammatic thing, which may be Peter's very short plan embellished with enough document, you know, low versus high and what the land uses is sort of an interesting tool. As long as you can maintain that notion, we don't have that in the city of Vancouver. We don't have an overall armature for how centers can grow. We don't have a hierarchy of centers. It was capacity driven, so not how the demand is accommodated. And the only, thing I would, minutes. the only thing I would add to that is that I also worry about what the priorities were for community services. Because mm -hmm. my impression has always been that if people have change and more density, they'd like to see something in return. Number seven, thank you. Uh, hi. <clears throat> I'd like to just uh, follow up on one of the earlier questions. This uh, question is directed at uh, Patrick. Uh, in terms of social resiliency, because what we are talking about is livability in a, in a plant, what role do you think the public realm and urban design uh, play in terms of social resiliency in the time of climate change and perhaps peak oil? Well, in a minute and a half left. <laughs> I want to try to get one more question, catch a question there. No, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm an urban designer. I call myself, I'm leading that group, so I think it's important. I think the drawing is a way to resolve some of those issues at the same time you're dealing with affordability, transportation. I think it's in the drawing. I wanted to pick up on what Larry said, because I was thinking the same thing. As a city planner who's done a lot of city plans, including uh, the most recent city of North Vancouver, OCP, which benefited greatly from Patrick's work and the work of DCS and the idea of the 100 year plan, I started to think, maybe, why do we fixate on the plan? Recognize that we're constantly planning, we're constantly making decision making, and how do we set up a framework in the city so that we're constant, you know, we can have these conversations, and maybe they're smaller in scale on some issues, bigger in scale on bigger issues that do require investments and big pictures. And maybe, maybe as much as I do believe that trending and drawing has to be part of the process, can we get off the form of development question to the model of development and questions of how we develop and what kind of relationships are involved between communities and the city and other stakeholders as we move forward. So my, just, my question is, do we really need a plan? And my answer is yes. And, and, and I want to go back to Frank's comment that we don't even have a diagram for the city. We don't have a diagram, an official we diagram. Do, not we really, really do. Not in the, in the regional context statement, you call that a diagram. I mean, that's not really a diagram. And I think that the official community plans of Surrey or North Vancouver and all of those, their, their fundamental land use map is pretty much a diagram to which a lot of other things are connected and attached. And again, it's my feeling, strongly felt and strongly delivered, that we don't have it. <laughs> and we need that. Okay. It's 1.30. I'm sorry, we don't have time for uh, more questions. Uh, thanks to the uh, Vancouver uh, City Planning Commission. If you want to follow more information on this, go to this website. Go to this website and there is lots of development organizations. One moment, please. One moment, please. First of all, we want to thank our presenters. We want to thank the Vancouver City Planning Commission with, uh, for their assistance in putting uh, this program together today. Uh, we want to thank we want to thank our sponsors, SFU uh, Public Square, Bingtown Architects, the city program, uh, and thank you all. Our next conversation.
This is our last conversation for 2014. We're going to take a break in December because nobody will show up in December, and we're going to take a break for the first Thursday in January, because that's January 1st, and I don't think you want to be here on New Year's Day. But we will be back on January 15th. We'll send you, if you haven't signed up, please put your uh, name and email on our sign-up sheets, which are are around here, and we will let you know a week or more in advance of what the topic will be. You are all invited to this public uh, event. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for helping to make this our most successful city conversation. Here.